Okay, this is the Ethan's program episode. Now, Ethan, if you could give any disclaimer for what we're about to talk about and what we're about to dive into, what is the disclaimer? What should the people know about the... What should people know about, you know, maybe a better way to ask it is, um, what would you like the person who's listening to come into the conversation having understood about your program? What are the kinds of things that you're like, hey, I do this thing and we may not talk about it too much, but like, um, you know, this is something that is, has been weirdly specific to me. Like there's just those kinds of things, like general disclaimers the do's and don'ts of interpreting this conversation. Um, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to make clear was like along this whole conversation, we're not, we're, this is not like a program that we're laying out for the audience. It's more of like a conceptual experiment. So that was be my only disclaimer. What are some do's and don'ts from your end? Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, at first I thought it was like for the listener, um, which they know about like the context of what we're getting into here. And I think that's important too. Like the context is, this is about me, not about me. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually yeah. trying to like go through my program and just lay things out for contest prep. Um, so this is kind of as as real as it gets. Like this is what you and I do in the car on the way to the gym. And uh, tomorrow I start bringing calories down 21 weeks out from New York, 24 weeks out from Toronto. Uh, I think I mentioned to you, I'm going to do Toronto too. Um, so and we have not talked about any of this in months. So this is usually what we do. Like, uh, every few months we you take a walk and just kind of, oftentimes we rehash the same questions. We rehash every few months and just see if we kind of have a different perspective. Yeah. Which is, yeah, I, lo I like doing that. And then, you know, the context that sort of frames, um, you know, this particular discussion, like I mentioned, uh, there's, you know, the drop in, in calories that's coming, you know, uh, oftentimes I'll get the question, you know, much like the person, uh, you know, passing me by on the street or on the subway or in the sauna, like the most common question is, you know, how long have you been lifting for? Um, you know, of course there's like, how much can you bench? Um, but oftentimes like the most common question with contest prep is like, um, you know, how, um, what do you drop your calories to? Like in, in kind of the understanding with that is like, there's an off season diet. And right now that, you know, at a peak was about 7,000 calories, about 1100 grams of carbs on average. And then the thought is like, then there's a contest diet and the contest diet is, you know, 3000 calories and, you know, 400 grams of carbs, but really like most processes, you know, it's iterative, it's progressive. And it's just simply like putting load on the bar, you might do an extra rep, you might put, you know, two and a half more pounds on there. And that's how this process works. So everything will kind of follow that sequence in a way of just like, you know, a progressive overload or a progressive diet. And um, that's, you know, a little bit of context for, you know, people that aren't sort of familiar with the process of getting ready for a show that there are certain things that are going to be tapered up and certain things that are going to be tapered down. And really the whole process is just one big, like uh, sort of stress management, um, uh, stress, like uh, basically like a, um, an exercise in stress management is, mm. is the way I would put it. So you're just sort of like, um, sorry. About okay. That. It's okay. It's organic. <laughs> Come here. Come here. Um, you know, so it's just budgeting, right? It's like as we drop this one variable, you know, maybe we have room for something else to go up. So, you know, as food comes out and cardio comes in and more posing time comes in, you know, how does that affect training volume? You know, as for example, like as calories come down, oftentimes an enhanced bodybuilder you'll see an increase in pharmacology, you know, so increased anabolic steroid use is pretty common uh, in that situation. So we're kind of like pulling on these levers and we're just sort of titrating different variables, bringing some up, bringing others down. And I, and I think we'll kind of see that a bit reflective in the the context, you know, of, of this training program. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I would say for me personally, um, because of the, the way that we set up, you know, our exercises and the effort that I put into each set, I think on average, like I need less sets than most people to accomplish the goal. So we're able to direct that stimulus, um, you know, very focally in terms of the muscle that we're trying to train. And we're able to fatigue that muscle much more than you would if you didn't have, say, good restraints, good resistance profiles, all things we've talked about in previous episodes. And those things make a huge, huge difference. You know, you take an exercise like, you know, imagine a person trying to do a leg press and there's like, you know, there's no back to the leg press. Like, and Mm -hmm. it's an extreme example, but it's like your output would go way, way down. And I think there's just so many examples of people doing exercises where they don't have good restraint, don't have good resistance profiles, like don't have the right, you know, framework as far as like setup and execution goes. And the output, it's not an order of like 5%, like they would imagine it to be. I think oftentimes it's orders of magnitude, you know, of a hundred percent, you know, at times where you're getting twice as much, twice as many reps, twice as much load, like, and, and also just the ability to progress really changes. Oftentimes there's like a limiter that presents itself where it's like, oh, I'm doing dumbbell lateral raises. And the reason I can't increase my dumbbell lateral raises is because the weight is so light and I just, you know, can't make small enough increases where on the leg press, I'm using a thousand pounds and it's easier I think that is a a very like salient point, but I also think on something like the dumbbell lateral raise where it's really difficult, where you're really weak, that also presents a lot of difficulty in progression. And and I think when you learn how to set something up a little bit better with say, you know, a cable, and then you take out the limiter of grip with wrist straps. And and the more you sort of move down that, um, you know, line of thinking as needed, not necessarily all right off the bat, but as needed, Uh, you find that the progressions are much more steady. So the context of, you know, needing a less volume because we are able to direct the stimulus um, and, you know, get more out of each set. And then also the context of, you know, one of my big limiters being orthopedic health with, you know, previous back injury and just, you know, after 20 years of training now and being 300 pounds, um, those things, you know, are major concerns to me. And, you know, of course, being a pro bodybuilder at this point means that, like, I have at least decent genetics and I respond well to training, drugs, nutrition. So I think it's not about me necessarily finding where the edge is at this point. It's really about, like, finding a stimulus that's sustainable and, you know, sort of pushes the button, checks the box, whatever you want to call it. And that's really the mindset that I come in with is just like, let's make this thing progressive in nature. Let's not shoot for the moon right away. And um, let's find something that works, not necessarily something that's optimal. And, you know, by optimal, what I'm, I don't mean the exercise selection set of execution. What I mean is if you think of like, <clears throat> you know, it, you, you could handle, you know, 200 sets per week, you know, so optimal is 199. I would much rather shoot the, the 150 and be in the safe zone than shoot the 199 and teeter right on the edge. And historically, like, you know, I've tried to find that quote unquote MRV in so many different ways, whether it be training or other vectors. And uh, I think, you know, when you, you've gotten to the point where you've explored the edges of that, uh, it doesn't benefit you necessarily to keep finding those and breaking them. You're much better off staying like a safe distance away. So hopefully that's, you know, some context, you know, for the listener and then everything kind of here on out is just you and I talking about the X's and O's. Yeah, it makes sense. One of the things that I wanted to mention just that you touched on was the concept of the restraints and the anchoring and people not really um, having, it's interesting because when people haven't experienced like appropriate, uh, just setting up appropriate counter forces for their exercise, like, you know, you gave the example of not having a back pad on a leg press you know, another good one for people to even just try. I think it's fun to try just to feel the difference. Like how much can you leg curl without the thigh pad? How much can you pull down without the thigh pad? How much can you, uh, and you know, oftentimes, interestingly enough, um, 
there are cases where like the in the leg curl example, if you don't have the thigh pad, you can't push the thing down. But like if you don't use a restraint, let's say like on a dumbbell curl, now all of a sudden it actually gives you a little bit more wiggle room to be able to kind of swing the weight. So it's all, always context dependent on like where the weight, like how much weight you end up lifting. Uh, but obviously, what you know, the weight you're holding is not the same as the resistance that, you know, you're acting against. So that's always case specific. But um, I think an interesting analogy, I use this in a couple different um, ways is like, or the way that I like to describe it to people is a person who has never like really done the anchoring restraint stability thing appropriately is like someone who's chronically uh, like underslept who sleeps like four to six hours a night, just consistently waking up, like all just really crap sleep quality. They they kind of just become accustomed to it. And, and now the, their normal is like the new, you know, piece of shit feeling. And then the second that you reveal to them that, you know, sleeping eight hours or that using like this kind of restraint for this kind of exercise is, is an option or you, you know, you, you set them up in a way that's like, uh, they haven't before and they're using the restraint and paying attention to the restraint like they haven't before. It's kind of like, you know, going from those four hour nights to those eight hour nights where you didn't even realize how sleep deprived you were. And now all of a sudden, you you know, your your eyes are open to the magical world of, of the eight hour night. You know, I'm making it sound somewhat uh, I'm, I'm, I'm magnifying the significance. Yeah. of it. But some people have very profound experiences like oh my god i've never felt this before or oh my god i've never been able to do this thing without this pain right and so you know i sent you a video yesterday and i posted the video of me doing the lateral raises on um the hip abduction machine and as i predicted like 50 percent of people were just, probably more than 50 percent were totally just baffled uh angry like over 100 comments on it now probably more of more of them negative than positive and i knew that was going to happen so like in the caption beforehand i wrote something like 50 percent of you will think i'm memeing and you'll think i'm an idiot and you'll like say this is over complicated and then the other 50 percent, which uh, again ended up being less than that uh will be like damn that's like that's a good idea like i didn't think that you know i could just like arrange a force like that on my arm and the whole point of it is to both uh, do something that people are going to watch and to do something that um, uh, uh, is is conceptually useful. So anyhow, you know, something like that kind of lateral raise may be the only lateral raise that someone does in their entire life up to that point that feels good for them, right? They've done the dumbbell thing their whole life. Maybe they've tried cables, but haven't been able to sort of set them up weirdly. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, let's go down and on the hip abduction machine and do this lateral raise, you know, oh my God, this, this, this feels great. I'm getting a great pump, whatever else. So anyway, I think that these concepts are, are a lot more, and I think I have a feeling we're going to talk a lot about the restraint concepts um, too. And so I just thought that was a good preface because it can be very powerful and it can be, um, it can feel quite different. So do, do things. Right? Yeah. 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 Go ahead. One, like, I find the resistance profile thing to almost be more like getting out of a bad relationship, you know, with like sleeping more, you're instantly like, no one that sleeps five hours wakes up from like an eight hour sleep. And is like, you know, chronically, and, and it's just like, oh, this is so much worse. You know, maybe <laughs> you can like nap in the middle of the day, or, you know, take a bunch of edibles and sleep too long and be kind of like groggy the next day. Yeah. For the most part, if you sleep a few more hours, like you're feeling better. But with the resistance profile thing, like a lot of people in the gym are like, I really like this exercise because of the squeeze at the end. You know, something's like super hard in the short position. And usually when you just talk to the, you know, average gym bro, <clears throat> you know, they go right to the hammer strength machines, you know, the pull downs and whatnot that are really hard short and they can get a good squeeze. And then their their early experience is switching the resistance profile it actually is something they're not familiar with mm -hmm. so i almost like could liken it in, in in this case to almost like like a codependent relationship or something it's like you're in like you know kind of an abusive like shitty situation and you're just used to being you know maybe treated a, a particular way yeah and yeah like oh this is weird like you know things being you know stable uh, I don't know about this whole situation, mm -hmm. kind of like revert back and revert back. Um, so yeah, it does take a little bit of like convincing and then a little bit of like experience to get to the point where you're not just like looking for that squeeze 
sensation. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a really good analogy. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that repeatedly. Um, and I also it's good for the listeners' context that. You recently taught me that codependence has a negative connotation. Uh, so now I'm aware that when you use it in that context, that uh, it was it was not meant to be a good thing. As yeah, it, yeah not, not always. Okay. Uh, the second part was following up on our episode last week. I was thinking about it yesterday because, um, you know, as, as you are aware, I uh, had to train by myself and uh, ended up... I ended up moving it to Saturday uh, this week because as we'll go over today on my back day on Thursday, I was experimenting with some like pull around uh, type movements, sort of like a, a thoracic lat emphasis. And just sort of historically, when I've done those, I've found that the following day or two, I'll have some uh, tightness in my back, you know, more lateral kind of like a, a QL sort of tightness that you know, is distinctly like not a good thing. You know, it's on one side. It doesn't feel like, oh, this is like a good muscular soreness. It's like, I, you know, um, I, I, I provided a, a stress to my spine where the next day I wake up and I kind of have a little bit of a stress response. Um, so I found that in a few different cases, but most, um, most notably when I'm trying to do anything that I'm resisting a twisting or sort of torsional force. Um, <clears throat> so for that reason, I moved the Friday training session to, to Saturday. And um, <clears throat> on Saturday, that's, you know, usually our Friday session where we do hamstrings, calves, middle delts, triceps. And I was thinking about our podcast the week before, because you had asked me, like, do I ever do, you know, agonist or you know, like same, you know, muscle group supersets? And it was funny because that's what I did, like basically the whole workout. And, um, it just reminded me, you know, that it does show up sometimes and gave me a little context for when it might show up. Mm. So, you know, just doing my like pre-workout walk and just kind of thinking about, um, you know, what was coming up for the day, sort of how I'd been feeling, what had happened on Thursday and, you know, how that might frame the workout coming up. And that's, you know, a lot of times a three and a half hour workout, um, and, you know, that has its effects. Like, as you know, I'm using a lot of weight on the, the seated leg curl that has its own effects. Um, <clears throat> just as far as like, you know, total load, uh, emotionally, orthopedically, whatnot. So what I ended up doing was a lot of those same muscle group supersets. And I, I, I was working through the framework as I was taking uh, my walk. And I was just thinking like, oh, this is interesting. This is how I actually think about all of this. And like, this is the problem that I was trying to solve. So I just knew based on what had happened Thursday, based on just how my energy levels were and, you know, like empty gym, you know, six o'clock, uh, day, you know, day before Christmas weekend, you know, all these things kind of frame how you're coming into that session and what you're capable of producing. And I think because there's so many like roads to Rome uh, in regards to hypertrophy, there are days where you can have a plan. And you can just say, you know what, like, I'm just not feeling this today. Like that doesn't happen to me very often, but even on prep, like if I had a certain meal written down and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to match macros and I'm going to eat this other meal instead, instead of, you know, uh, chicken mm -hmm. and olive oil, I'm going to have beef, whatever. Right. So it's kind of like that whole, you know, matching macros, kind of thing like it's not the quote unquote if it fits your macros like we're just going to eat you know shit food as long as it fits in but it's like yeah we're still going to pick good exercises we're still going to get pick good foods and we're going to get to the same place so <clears throat> one of the things i wanted to do was just not lift super heavy that day um and the funny thing is for me like technically i'm never really lifting heavy because i always am doing like on average 15 plus reps at the very least 12 plus reps. So for me, it's never heavy, right? I'm never doing low reps, but even like, you know, on an absolute value, it's heavy. Like if I'm doing the leg curl and we put 45s, you know, plates on two forty five pound plates on top of the stack, like that shit's heavy. It's heavy for other areas of your body. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, today's just not a day that I'm feeling like getting up for lifting heavy weights. Today's not a day where I want to be in the gym for three and a half plus hours and get home at 
nine o'clock at night and uh, get yelled at by my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I want to <clears throat> make sure I get all my meals in a timely manner. I want to get up uh, early enough tomorrow so that I can get my cardio in before, you know, the gym closes on Christmas Eve, all these factors. Right. And I'm like, okay, so <clears throat> how can I lay this training day out, you know, to solve for those problems and what sort of adjustments, you know, might I make? You know, as you know, one of the things that takes a lot of time with our training on this day is I set up this weighted vest for the uh, the hip extension I do, which is awesome because I weight the back of the vest and what it allows, uh, w- 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 the benefit I get out of that is <clears throat> we have this really like vertically inclined uh, hip extension or some people will call it like a hyper extension or back extension. I use that for like an RDL type of movement where I get a lot of hamstrings out of it. And, uh, you know, the one downside is that it's going to be a little bit harder at the top than say like an RDL would be. And if I was looking for a really good profile where the last reps are just super slow, um, it would be beneficial for it to be a little harder at the bottom, but you kind of have this choice. Like either I can make it harder at the bottom or I can make it easier at the top. Basically like, you know, if I put a band on something uh, normally it makes it harder at the top. If we set it up for a reverse band, say like a hack squat, for example, now it makes it uh, easier um, easier at the bottom and therefore heavier at the top. So in this example, um, I make it easier at the top and therefore harder at the bottom with the, with the weights in the back of the weighted vest. And that's really cool because I'm like grinding, grinding, grinding to get to the top. And then at a certain point, those weights start sort of pulling me down and back and I'm able to finish that last little bit of the hip extension. So love it, but it also takes a long ass time to set up. I also can't uh, put on the vest by myself, right? (laughs) I had to make accommodations for that. Uh, The seated leg curl, you know, go ahead. Just just as a visual for people on that description, a helpful um, thing to think about to describe what Ethan's talking about is if you were to put a backpack on, just a regular backpack, and you put like a 45 pound plate or two 45 pound plates, something heavy in the backpack, and you just stood up, that backpack would be pulling you backward. But then if you leaned over and you went to pick something up, that backpack would try to smush your spine down toward the floor. So it's kind of the same pattern there where the backpack at the bottom, when Ethan's at the bottom of the motion and he's sort of facing the ground, all of the weight is smushing his spine down to the floor. And then as he comes up, much like with the regular backpack, just as you're normally walking around wearing it, it tries to pull you backwards. So that's what Ethan is describing with it being a little bit um, relatively uh, uh, harder at the bottom and relatively easier at the top. 100%. So I won't go through the whole workout, but I'll just go through what I did for hamstrings. And then you can sort of like extrapolate to the rest of it. But um, seated hamstring curl, as you know, again, the time component there is like I have to take off the the back of the machine so that I can put gym pins on the back and on the front. Um, and then, like I mentioned, it's also super heavy. Normally, when you're there, we also make the profile better with you sort of assisting in the short position. Even though the Atlanta slide curl is decent at dropping off short, it doesn't drop off enough. So a partner really helps there. So I now have two exercises where, you know, I'm – going into it knowing that the concepts that we talked about earlier as far as like in this case mostly the the profile is not as you know optimal so i'm not going to get as much stimulus per set i also want to cut down uh on the load and you know the the time and one of the ways i can do that is with the time between sets thus you know same muscle group superset So as I mentioned before, there's like, you know, fundamentally not a huge difference between just like me getting on the seated leg curl and say taking 30 seconds, you know, rest in between sets or me going, you know, seated leg curl to lying leg curl or seated leg curl to hip extension. Like obviously, you know, as we switch exercises, uh, there's a, you know, you're training that muscle from a different length. You're training that muscle from a different action. You know, so if I wanted to favor just like total output a little bit more, uh, I'm going to get a little bit more output by switching between exercises than I would just staying on the same one and doing repeated sets. So I went into it just thinking like, look, um, 
yes, I do believe that uh, decreasing rest periods or doing same muscle supersets, you know, can approximate a pretty similar stimulus. But the more things you drop off, the more you say, all right, I'm going to rest, you know, a very short rest, 30 seconds, or uh, the more you say, like, I'm going to slow the tempo down a ton and I'm going to pause in the short position. Now we're making another accommodation where it's like, now you just made the profile potentially even worse. So these were all things that I was doing. Like I would do the seated hamstring curl and I really just change a lot of times when I'm switching between phases or I'm trying to just sort of bring down stress on a particular training session, I'll just change my mindset. So instead of changing the program and saying like, okay, I'm going to do, you know, two RIR or last time I did 200 pounds, this time I'm going to do 180. Um, I just really sort of tune up or down my intention on it. And I think it's a very valuable way to just kind of come full circle and constantly refine your execution and refine like how much weight do you actually need here? Are you doing things as perfectly as you thought you were doing? Just coming into a session and saying like today, instead of using the most amount of load for the most amount of reps, you know, I'm going to just do basically the least amount of reps I can with this weight and go to failure. I'm just going to make it as perfect as I can possibly make it. And there's just levels to that. Like there's the level of just like getting slapped in the back of the head and screaming and you got the music on and you're moving the eccentric fast and you're, you're um, using a lot of momentum to move into the concentric all the way to like, you know, <clears throat> the, the sort of like, you, you usually like natty nerdy crowd who's just like, I'm going to do a six second eccentric. I'm going to pause at both ends of it, you know, like, so there's, you know, there's a whole spectrum there. And I think you can tune that spectrum based on your goal for the day. So it's not uncommon if I have, you know, had something going on orthopedically, or I'm trying to reduce stress for a session in a day or a week to just come in and say, all right, today, like, I'm going to just use, you know, a reasonable load, whatever that is. I don't even need to count the reps. And I'm just going to do like, you know, very controlled eccentric, pause in the length and maybe even pause short as well. So that's what I did. And because I made all those accommodations, because the profile was worse, I did more sets. And I think that's very reasonable. I definitely think there's a point where whether it be, you know, rest periods, whether it be because of uh, another limiting factor like systemic fatigue, whether it be because the profile is not as good, you don't have a partner there, you're just emotionally tuned way down. There may be reasons to just like adjust the total volume. So um, <clears throat> even though I said before, like, look, um, I think it all comes down to like what the limiter is. You, you can set a session up where you're purposely creating limiters for yourself, but you're switching around where that limiter is. So if I've decided that like, I want to pause short and I want to take, you know, short rests and do uh, same muscle supersets, and I'm not going to have as good of a profile, all that stuff I just mentioned, then you might just add a set or two. So normally we do, you know, three sets. I did five sets in way less time than it would normally take to set all that stuff up, uh, do the three sets. And, you know, instead of like pinning the plates on, I just put the weight at the bottom of the stack. And it's like, that's a way where if I was like trying to do as many reps as possible, I could probably do 30 or something. And I literally didn't count at all. Like my guess is I probably did somewhere in the ballpark of 15 or so, maybe last 12 to 15 for the first set, just super slow, pause at the bottom. And then in this particular particular case, I set a one minute timer and I just went back and forth and back and forth. So I get done with the seated leg curl, set a one minute timer walk over the hip extension. There's no heavy breathing or anything by the time I get to the hip extension, back and forth, back and forth. So those five sets or 10 sets collectively probably took half the time that it took me to do, you know, the six sets normally. Um, and I did the majority of the training session sort of in that fashion. And uh, every week it's taken me three and a half hours to do it. I made it out in about two. Mm. Uh, and I did a lot of things for five sets instead of three <laughs> sets. You know, it's, you know, you want to hear something hilarious. You know how I told you. So, so the reason that we were not training is because uh, uh, Arch had a, her performance at three, which is spectacular, by the way. Um, and that morning I had, 
I had to do a lot of like a combination of uh, just getting ahead on a lot of filming and editing stuff. So I was shorter on time. And so almost to the T, that's what I did with the workout is I took the normal hip extension because most hip extensions are like basically you may as well make them just parallel to the floor. You know, it's how low. They, so I put like a big dumbbell underneath it, recline it way up. And I basically just between the lying leg curl and the hip extension went back and forth. Like I stopped. I didn't even really count sets. I just went until I was like, yeah, oh, this is probably like hamstrings are fucked up. I'm, I'm good to go here. Yeah. Um, so it's funny how that kind of worked out with without any sort of, you know, communication of that prior to right now. Um, so, yeah, that's cool. I think that's a really good application. I want to also now. So let's rewind. Let's rewind and let's go back to and I'm and I'm also not tied to talking about every exercise in every single day. I think we probably could make that happen. We're not like under any time constraint, um, but I still I would prefer to go over fewer things more thoroughly. And then we have like an additional episode, maybe covering the second half or whatever we don't have left. So let's go back to like day one of the week uh, and let's let, let's dive into those specific exercises from day one. OK. Um, so it's day one of four, I have four training days. Um, the reason I have four training days is that I find with just the total amount of, um, you know, load total amount of like stress that I can put my body through in a given, you know, rep set exercise and day, um, that orthopedically I do better with longer times in between sessions. Like you could say, all right, you're going to do eight sets a week for an exercise. Like should you do all those eight sets in one day or you, should you split it between two days? On paper, like you get more work done splitting it between the two days. But my experience is that orthopedically, I do a lot better with a lower frequency. And I don't think that's the case for majority of people. I program for the majority of people doing, you know, twice a week. So often, you know, sometimes more. Um, but for myself, I found experientially like less training days really benefits me. And I also really like, uh, to have a day where I just don't go in the gym at all. And I feel mentally relationship wise, physically, like it really benefits me to just take an afternoon to chill. So there's four training days and, uh, I've had good success, uh, training anywhere from 60 sets a week um you know up to we've you know we've done 200 sets a week but i haven't mm -hmm. really seen any additional muscle growth you know at those 200 sets a week but i have seen you know some more orthopedic issues um as i've scaled in you know it, classically i would sort of go from 80 sets up to about 120 sets and escalate that over the course of a training block so i tried that i say classically but sort of like you know, in the, the Mike Isertel era, for me, it was more of like uh, the Broderick Chavez era, who's, you know, like Mike's coach uh, for certain aspects. Um, that's kind of where that came from for me. And uh, obviously the, the mean of that is, you know, 100 sets. And I've actually found for myself, um, I do a lot better when things just broadly are stable. Um, meaning like, I like my schedule to be relatively stable. Like, I don't want to be traveling too much when I'm trying to make a lot of progress, like just the more stable I can have things. And, and I think this is a general biological concept, you know, for growth, um, that like everything just functions better for me. So I think there's sort of an optimal tune stability where it's like, you want some variability, you want some novelty in your life. But when you're growing, if you can have things relatively consistent and predictable, I think that's, you know, mostly a good thing. And you just kind of have to tune to your own personality, how stable you want things to be. So in saying that, it sounds like, you know, well, how does, you know, uh, picking your set escalation apply to that? I really like to just pick a steady training program and then have my progressions be mostly through, uh, in this case, reps. So, you know, my, my, program is generally um, uh, sets of 15 to 20 reps, maybe as low as, as 12, as high as like, you know, 25. And um, when I get to the upper end of that, then I increase the weight uh, by like five to 10% and kind of restart. As I've mentioned before, I don't look at the reps that I did the previous week. My goal is just to do perfect reps and I get what I get. So with that context, what I've been doing recently is just kind of a monolithic, a number of sets per week, 
which has been, you know, 80 to 100 sets. Uh, throughout this last off-season block, I've been more on the 100 set range. And uh, like I said, not like nothing, you know, it's difficult to pick up on small differences. Like, did you add, you know, grams of muscle to your middle doubt? Like, how are you going to pick up on that? But, uh, <laughs> you know, because I have had success in the lower range of 60 to 80, um, and I'm looking at the road ahead and I have the 21 week prep. I think I'm going to go from the hundred sets I have now down to about 80 and pick something that's just like, you know, playing the tortoise game versus the hare. Like I would rather have a more sustainable program that I can just draw out for a long time. And I, you know, because of how negative it would be for something, you know, to go wrong, whether that be just accumulating fatigue and it mounting in like a, um, you know, in the sense of, um, you know, just being tired during the day, being unmotivated, like uh, having sleep issues, you know, and, and for a lot of people, 100 sets is, is not a lot. But again, it, that looks very different for what, you know, I'm doing in the gym. So I'm moving, I'm going to move towards uh, 80 sets, drop, you know, drop off about 20 sets here and shoot for something that I feel is just like, yeah, I could do that. I feel like I could do that almost forever. And that was kind of the point that I made in the beginning is like, sometimes it's not shooting for the upper end and just saying like, yeah, I could probably do that for a while. You know, at times, you know, it's just picking the thing that like, yeah, I feel like I could pretty much, you know, do that forever. In the context of where I'm at right now, that's an appropriate decision. For a lot of people listening to this, they could probably be doing this. Um, you know, just quick aside, like there was, you know, the study that Brad Schoenfeld did where he had, you know, basically beginners like doing 45, uh, sets three times a week, you know, of quad training and like they grew a ton. It mm -hmm. just, you know, goes to show for a different person, you know, more is more and more is better. Uh, so it's all super context dependent. So that's kind of the framework of the week. We have the four days. Uh, on, you know, Monday is mainly kind of like a, a push centric day where it's like chest, uh, you know, front delt. Um, and then towards the end, I'll put in my, my biceps. Um, and then, you know, recently I've been doing a little bit of tricep stuff there, but we might take that out right now. So we'll say kind of like pushing and, uh, biceps Tuesday, uh, is like all things legs uh thursday is uh back and uh friday is hamstrings triceps and some middle delts so that's a framework for the week so if we go into monday now we're um <clears throat> we're starting off with chest and i'll try to stay very focused on that specifically and not start giving framework for you know what i'm doing on my way to the gym and all that kind of shit <laughs> But, yep. you know, for the record, that's how I think, right? Like, it's the, I'm framing in terms of everything, you know? Um, it's not, it, 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 often, as you know, as I go on these sort of, like, asides, you know, I get in, I get into thoughts, you know, we're talking about a training program, and I'm telling you about my day, or I'm, I'm talking about, like, who I'm training with on that day, or what gym I'm at. All those things have a huge influence. Um, but specifically, just getting into the start of the day, I've <clears throat> done my, hours worth of preparation and meals and all the shit after I've gotten done working with clients and I've walked up to the first exercise I'm going to do for that day, which is a old Nautilus machine that is like a, a pack deck. So like kind of a fly motion and it's got a big, uh, big pad that goes uh, like right on my elbow, kind of like bicep area. And uh, it's in like a decline position. So we're focusing more on uh, the fibers that are oriented th that way for the pecs, sort of like the sternal costal fibers. I feel, you know, a tremendous pump like in that area, not so much in the front delts. And, um, you know, my, my focus there is starting off by getting into like a, a relatively short position for those fibers uh, of the pecs. And the thing that I like about it 
is it really like takes the uh, stress off the elbows and the wrists in the beginning. And I can also set up the profile to be incredible. So what I will typically do is, or what I've lately been doing is I'll do a couple sets where I lean forward and that just allows me to line up with the direction of resistance in the machine a little bit better. And I will just do, um, we'll just do the part of the range really where it's still decently heavy in a shorter position. And I would say it's kind of like an eight out of 10 resistance profile when I'm leaning there. Um, if I could, because I'm leaning forward, I would also have a pad behind me that I can kind of push back into as that machine not only spreads my arms, but also kind of as a force pushing me backwards. I'll do two sets like that. And then on the last set, what I do to make the profile even better is I will lean back into this like vertical pad behind me and it's really heavy uh, in that position there. So it's very difficult for the close to like lengthened position for those fibers or the mid to, to long position. And then as I use my body weight to lean forward, that becomes sort of an assistance, uh, you know, making it easier um, as I lean forward because my, you know, gravity is pushing me downwards and it really allows me to sort of like titrate, so to speak, or, or, or augment like where that profile uh, is hardest. And by changing the amount I lean, the speed in which I lean, I can make it incredibly hard where I want it to be, incredibly easy uh, where I want it to be. So the last set that I do there is just these like super grindy, reps where it's incredibly slow at the end and <clears throat> I, I perceive that to be a great profile i don't do that for every set because it is you know an incredibly taxing way to do it and it probably does add some measure of uh you know spine load to it so that's my first exercise i like to do that when it's a pack uh focused um you know workout because now when i go into my next exercise i'm still training the same fibers um, I'm using a Nautilus chest press. Um, you know, it's got the like uh, the foot lever where I can bring it out to a good starting position for me. It's set up with a shoulder uh, and wrist position, you know, where I can get those those fibers like uh, to a fully lengthened position. And I'll basically do almost like three quarter reps or length and partials with that Nautilus chest press because in terms of how the machine converges, like that feels best to me in that range. And I'm really able to keep the stimulus on the packs and the profiles, you know, pretty good there where I am. I could maybe do a rep or two more partial than that at the end. So, but the nice thing is I don't have to use as much load then on that Nautilus chest press. So I'm not pin loading a bunch of plates on it. And then the wrists and the elbows don't become this limiting factor. So those are the first two exercises. They're paired together. Uh, for the reasons that I just mentioned. Yeah. And so a couple comments there. Um, I think that there's a huge advantage if anyone listening has access to a fly machine, whether it be pack fly or reverse fly that has those pads that just sit, uh, you know, above the elbow and a couple main reasons for that. The first one just being that, um, it's probably going to be easier to manage from an execution standpoint. If the pad is higher up, it's also closer to you, which means it actually moves a much smaller distance, which likely means that the weight in all in, for in terms of like by guess would probably move less too. So maybe less inertial effect. But um, I would say the bigger benefit is just the fact that if something isn't in your hand, um, it can't really influence your shoulder in more than one plane. So for example, if you're doing like um, a, a pack fly on a machine or with a cable or something like that, and it's in your hand, you have the opportunity to not only load your elbow um, in a, a direction that's usually not the direction that the elbow bends, but you also have the opportunity if your elbow bends to load your shoulder in what we would call the transverse plane, as opposed to just, you know, the sagittal plane normally that you're trying to load. So where you can, I think it's, it's very helpful to load things, you know, even like lateral raises uh, on the humerus or just not in the hand 
uh, for those reasons, because it not only makes the motion less complex, so output for the target tissue usually goes up, but as a consequence of that, um, usually people end up feeling less wonky stuff around the shoulder because there has to be less co-contraction around the shoulder. And then I would say the benefit, obviously, of something like the, the press as opposed to just the fly is that with the press, because the loading is what we'll call linear as opposed to arcing or tangential, uh, because the press is linear, you're able to load uh, shoulder girdle motion. So in the example of the fly, you're not really able to do that to the same degree that you are um, a press, um, simply because in a press, your shoulder girdle is directly being shoved backward, whereas in a fly, uh, for a vast majority of the motion, it is not. So there's also a little distinction there in that uh, including the fly as a, something that is different from the press is not only different from a um, just a loading perspective, but as a consequence of that, um, where you're actually able to to train a muscle in terms of its length, because when you're when you're loading a fly, uh, again, you can't really load uh, the shoulder girdle in the same way, which oftentimes prevents actually uh, that additional length that you're able to get in a press. So if you're able to do a fly in a press, I think that's a great pairing for more reasons than, than, uh, than just one. So after you finish the press, which is more so like the partial range or what visually appears to be partial range, um, where do you go from there? I go over to, uh, cables. Um, it's a, you know, dual cable stack and I set up an incline bench and I move that incline bench back. So if the cable stack were, let's say against a wall and uh, the cables, you know, were obviously facing away from the wall, my bench is right up against the wall. And I set it up to be sort of like an incline, like fly press kind of situation um, where the cables are basically coming from a little bit in, down and in front of me. And, uh, you know, I'm able to find a really comfortable width for those cables where at the bottom I can get into, you know, a nice length and position uh, for the clavicular fibers of the pecs and the front delt. And then I press, you know, sort of in an overhead fashion, but it's not, you know, the same as if I just set up, uh, you know, some dumbbells and like, you know, um, you know, an overhead press or an incline press because, it's cool with the cables when you're like, oh, is you know, is this an incline press or is the decline press? Well, it depends on where the cables are coming from. So in this case, the cables are coming from in front of me. So it makes it more of like an incline uh, path of motion. And uh, my target, like I said, there is more of the like clavicular fibers of the packs. And obviously I'm getting, you know, some front delt with both of those presses as well. So that's like a kind of like a converging press fly raise type thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it looks certainly like a press. And if we called it a fly, it would just simply because of the resistance direction, because the cables are, you know, more, you know, coming from a more lateral direction than if I had, you know, a pair of dumbbells. Right, but right. Itself looks like a press. And, uh, you know, where my arms end up in terms of like at my forehead, if I had dumbbells there, those dumbbells would be pulling me down towards the floor. And it would probably be more of a moment for like at the elbow, kind of like a skull crusher. But in this case, because they're pulling me forward, um, I feel as if I can get the, you know, clavicular pack in front out uh, in, in a relatively short position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think it's worth noting that um, those two muscles, if we want to call them two muscles, um, upper pack and front delt, they, they will have some degree of involvement in the other stuff. But whether or not they are the limiter of those other things is something to be to be questioned. So in your case, obviously not. Um, and yeah, just the only context for that one would just be the loading, just because, um, like you mentioned, there are a lot of people that will assume that incline bench means incline muscles. And uh, you could easily set that up in a way with a cable stack that an incline bench would equal decline muscles, depending on how you, you know, orient yourself to, to the cables and how the cables relate to you. Um, so that's kind of, that feels more like a short position thing. Like you're kind of failing when you're getting up and in, in, into the squeeze there. Yeah. And, and it seems like maybe you can get a little bit of drop off as far as the profile, 
it's almost like at a certain point, maybe your arms are kind of pulling back towards the floor. Yeah. Never fully get there, but it seems like, you know, regardless, you, you could speak to this, maybe it's a little bit better profile than I would get, you know, with another implement or, you know, another force direction. Yeah. 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 Um, that's, a, I think that's a tough one to describe visually, but it's kind of like the difference it, for anyone listening, who's sitting, it would be like the difference between raising your arm forward in front of you and then reclining all the way back so that your hand sort of was passing toward the other side of your head. I think that that, that is, uh, that's not a distinction to be underestimated in terms of like how big of a role that can actually play in, in what you feel like if you're doing an incline press where the cables are pulling you backward, you know, that's all that extra weight, even, even though like it's not in the direction of the cable, it's still like you have to hold your hand upward from there. Much like if you were doing a triceps extension with your arm, like all the way hanging out to the side, you still have to hold your arm up in space, even though the low direction is, is distinct. So there's potentially less complexity with having less resistance somewhere where you're, where you're weaker. Um, and interestingly enough, it is a little bit weird to get to get used to like that kind of, Oh, you know, incline press where your hands end up sort of wanting to fall backward behind your head. But um, I think there's a high amount of tremendous payoff. I mean, you could also argue that then you have the opposite problem where like, if your arm is totally over your, your head, then you have things like, you know, now your lower pecs are holding your arm uh, to some degree. Um, um, and something, you know, like your lats maybe getting more involved, but that's probably not, super relevant to this discussion. So it's not that the dumbbell inclined would be bad. It's just that in this particular case, you're looking to kind of get a little bit of additional loading toward where those are more specifically moving your arm. So um, I think that's just one more comment on that to make is um, presses that are, are loaded really heavy, you know, where your arm is more behind your body, there'll be a lot more overlap with a lot more stuff contributing to that. But the more that you get to the quote squeezed positions, the more specific by definition that you are um, training specific muscles, you know, so if you're getting your arm across your body or over your head, those, those are going to lend much more toward upper pec front delt stuff and a lot less of the other um, stuff. Whereas, you know, the, the first press that you mentioned is going to be a big sort of blend of uh, a lot of those things regardless. So you go from that fly to press to press fly uh what follows that yeah and you know i could say you know almost everyone's like well they need more you know upper pack right you need more clavicular pack i'm, I'm uncertain you know to begin with like if you <laughs> could just hypertrophy that area you know where where you could like obviously like you said there's just so much carryover between the exercises but also like would one's body really allow for just like a gigantic you know head of a dowel or a gigantic like um you know, uh, direct, you know, like one direction of fibers, you know, for the, or, or sort of like section of the packs. Um, I'm not so sure. I've never seen it. Like, I don't think you're going to, I think you're going to see like rib cage shape, uh, you know, like sternum clavicles, like probably have a lot more influence on the shape of your packs than, you know, the order of the exercises. So for that reason, like, even if, you know, upper packs is the focus for everyone, I don't start with the upper pack front doubt. Cause I think if I were to fatigue my front doubts, your point about the other press, like it probably would end up being more of a limiter on the other press. So that's why I start mm -hmm. with um, those fibers instead. So <clears throat> uh, just one comment on that too. Yeah. Uh, the way that I kind of look at that comment in general now uh, is like, if someone says I need more upper pack or my upper pack is lagging, it would kind of be like saying uh, I need more glute min or I need more glute mead because those are lagging, you know, relative to my glute max. And it's like, well, your glute max is like, you know, twice the size from a surface area perspective. So it's like, in terms of the pack, your the portions of your pack that attach to your sternum and your uh, costal cartilages are way bigger than the clavicular portion. And they're always going to be bigger, <laughs> no matter how much you train your upper pack. So it's kind of like, this thing is the way it is because of where it attaches and the width of its attachment site. So I think that's also just something to mention is it's kind of like that. Yeah. That's supposed to be like smaller in general. Um, okay. So, so yeah, same, same theme now is I've moved to something where I could bias uh, a shorter position. Um, in this case, you know, I'm not so much limiting 
the um, you know the length and range as I would be you know with the fly. Like I'm still getting into it, but the bias uh, because of the setup is still like I can get into the short position. I'll probably fail first because of the short position, even though again it's kind of like you know maybe a seven out of ten you know profile wise. So then I move into a plate loaded incline press and um you know normally this machine wouldn't be that great because it's almost like a hammer strength machine it, it's not but it you know it's got this long lever on the back that um you know increases the resistance as i press towards the top you know which isn't as bad in a press as it would be you know and say a, a, a pulling motion um but it's also converging um so i don't want it to be too heavy you know in the top position so again, as I mentioned earlier, you kind of have two choices. Like, do I want to get help as I get into the shortened position or do I want to make it harder in the lengthened position? And uh, just based on the piece of equipment I'm using, um, it may be more or less advantageous, you know, for the person helping or my ability to sort of augment the machine. So this one's pretty cool. And I do this in a few places, like what I have my training partner do is because he's got this super long lever to work with in the back. So he's got a long crowbar. He's got a lot of leverage on me. It doesn't take much for him. Like it's a pain in the ass to kind of lift the back of the machine to help me. And it's not as steady. What I have him do is just push down on the eccentric. So me I meaning to, to clarify when he pushes, it's more forward. resistance against you. Yeah. Yeah. So I do again, that kind of like, what looks like a length and partial kind of three quarters rep, very pack centric in this case, more upper pack, uh, but obviously still, you know, getting the rest in there as well. And, you know, I get towards my three quarters or top range in the motion. He starts pressing down and he doesn't really let up like at the, you know, length and position or start of the concentric. He kind of still maintains a little bit of tension and then lets up a little bit. So it makes it harder on the eccentric, harder kind of like at that initiation to mid, and then a little bit lighter at the top. And because it's another human being who, you know, you guys get practice with it over time, he can, again, to use that word titrate, really just like pick the amount of tension that he wants to give me. And then we can even at the end of the set go the opposite direction. And then he starts helping me on the concentric. Um, so Again, we move into a place now where I can get those fibers a little bit more lengthened, but specifically, as we've talked about before, it's not just the position you're getting into, it's what's happening with the resistance there. And in this case, uh, we're creating an exercise where the resistance is most challenging on the eccentric and into the lengthened position, which is not the case on the exercise before. So we kind of have this pattern of getting into a, a shorter position first with still some tension, you know, mid to lengthen, uh, taking out, you know, some potential orthopedic limitations, be it at the elbow, shoulder, you know, same thing with this press, like it's not going to feel as good if I loaded this thing super heavy, then like the amount of load and sort of the, the direction of those forces that I would be dealing with on the cable, you know, so moving into a more kind of like pronated grip, incline press, you know, if I did that first in my workout, that wouldn't feel nearly as good if I did it, you know, is when I do it at the end. Um, and with that partner, you know, resisting the eccentric and that initial concentric motion, it's, it's nasty. It feels great orthopedically and, you know, subjectively all those, you know, measures are there as far as stimulus. Okay, cool, cool. So, so, so far you, in terms of order, it's kind of been like squeeze position, lower pack, middle pack, lengthen position, middle pack, lower pack, squeeze position, upper pack, front delt, longer position, upper pack, front delt-ish. Correct. Okay. So that's, we're four deep. Yeah, and that, that's really it as far as like packs and front delts go. You know, what I've been shooting for broadly is about uh, nine sets per body part. So oftentimes that works out to like, um, you know, three exercises for three sets. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, it's not as simple as like, well, is this is one set for this, but not one set for this other thing. So just kind of being in that ballpark of maybe like eight to 12, you know, sets uh, per muscle group for me. So if we're splitting this into like 
was this a front delt focused exercise, a pack focused exercise? Like, is it nine sets for the costal pack? Like, well, what about the clavicular pack? Like, you know, when you really get nuanced with it, it it's very difficult to say like, well, how do you count this as one? Um, but in general, most of the time I'm doing about three sets and, you know, some things are real simple to add up, like, you know, hamstrings aren't getting, you know, volume from, you know, my calf raises, you know, maybe there's a little bit, you know, sort of in an isometric fashion in my like squatting motions. But if I do like a short position hamstring curl, you know, in this case, it's standing for me versus lying. I do a seated one and I do a hip extension movement, three, 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 nine sets across the board, pretty easy to add up. When we start dividing it into like very specific exercises for divisions of the pack, and this one biases the front out more, this one has a complete resistance profile, this one doesn't, you know, it gets pretty complicated to add up. So you just kind of shoot the middle. So that's how I got there. Uh, and then I finished that training session with biceps and uh, <clears throat> it's basically, it's one machine and it's a, a preacher bench um, set up with a, a cable at the like in front and in, 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 in low so the preacher bench you know is one again one unit is very close to the cable and the cable is at the floor and um because of the position of the cable there i'm able to set my body up in a way where the most uh where the cable is perpendicular uh to my forearm so where it's pulling on me the most where it's the hardest is towards the bottom of the movement. I would say at about like 15, 20 degrees, maybe 25 at the most is where the cable picks up the most tension. And then when I get to, as you said, the squeeze or short position of the exercise at the top of the preacher curl, that's where the cable's more or less running parallel uh, to my forearm. So that getting a good resistance profile there. I do three sets, single arm there for me. Um, you know, I've had surgery on both shoulders, football, rugby, um, and one of those shoulder surgeries severely limited the amount of external rotation I have. Um, so, you know, even just being larger, that would be limited to begin with typically, but, um, the cable's really nice because it allows me to set up in a bit more internally rotated, uh, position. So I position my arm inwards. Uh, I also like to sort of turn uh, the handle inwards a little bit so that the cable's kind of pulling um, the, you know, the inside of my palm downwards. So it's, it's pulling me into like a pronation uh, position. And then I have to resist that by doing the opposite. So I'm resisting that by essentially supinating and I can still flex my elbow with the cable lined up with my forearm versus if I had a dumbbell, that dumbbell would be acting straight down towards the floor and versus lining up with this, you know, inwardly positioned, uh, you know, elbow that I have. And then I simply just flip around on the bench and <clears throat> on this preacher bench, the back is flat like many preacher benches and I'm still seated. I'm still doing a single arm, but now I'm facing away from the cable and the pad is on the back of my arm. So against my tricep, uh, but you know, right down to my elbow. And again, the cables, you know, perpendicular to my forearm at the, at the bottom of the movement. And as I come up, it's more parallel to my forearm. So now I've moved from a more, you know, shoulder flexed or somewhat overhead position to a shoulder extended or, you know, arm in line with my torso or slightly behind position. And I do three sets of each of those, uh, you know, in two different shoulder positions. Cool. So you kind of have one where we're going to label it like shorter overall muscle length but resistance still heavy toward a straight elbow position and then overall longer muscle length for the second one but similar setup insofar as where the resistance is heaviest to you so in both cases this is a good example of the difference between the long short distinction in terms of muscle length and then the long short distinction in terms of resistance because both of these, as you're describing, are the same in terms of resistance, but in terms of total muscle length, uh, very different. So what what it will look like at your elbow and at your hand is is the same in terms of joint angles, but at your shoulder, you know, in one case it sounds like it's you're you're a little bit more sort of in front of your body, and then in the other, it's kind of just following that arc backward with your arm behind your body, right? 
Cool. So you do three and three there, and then you call it a day. Yep. Okay. So that's day one. Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip to day three where I'm doing uh, back training. Uh, okay. I end up extending this into two podcasts. Just selfishly, I have the most questions about back day. I feel pretty good about the other ones. So we'll stick, you know, stay, say we stick with upper body for this podcast. Yeah. And then next week we can cover Tuesday, Friday and just talk lower. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be a good way to go. All right. <clears throat> so there's probably some things, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning where I want to reduce volume. One exercise I didn't mention that I was doing, uh, you know, on Monday is I was doing some extra tricep work in there that I'll probably end up coming out and I'll probably just, you know, so that was an example of where there are some things I still do twice a week where I was doing some middle delts twice a week, some biceps, triceps twice a week. But on that second day, often I would just make it something I could recover from pretty quickly. Maybe something with a profile that was actually a little bit heavier, short, um, and something that, you know, was pretty hard, um, you know, historically that I, I found I almost never run into issues orthopedically with because it is sort of limited uh, in a sense by things like a resistance profile. Um, so on this day, I'm kind of trying to figure out what things to take out. And um, I'll kind of just go through where I've been. And then because I haven't really worked this out in my head, uh, whereas on the Monday was a good example of, I feel pretty good about that program. I think it's, you know, I can always go from three to two sets if I want, but it's not taking exercises out. This is one's going to be a day where I probably take some exercises out and I probably put something new in as well. So again, like I kind of have to, in this uh, situation, come back to like uh, why the order is what it is. Like I, I train with Annie, my wife on this day and she gets out of work at four. She meets me at four 30, but I get to the gym at like three and um, you know, I'll do, do my prep work and then I start training at like 3 30 so that she's not training for you know two and a half three hours and uh, allows us to get home in time to eat dinner and go to bed on time so like it is you know it does become <laughs> relevant because initially we would you know I would meet her we would drive to the gym at 4 30 we'd start you know at basically 5 30 and then we wouldn't really get home in time to get enough sleep so I set it up so that I would try to do the things beforehand that weren't really necessary for her to add on to her training that would just allow us to go home a little bit earlier and, you know, pick things where they, again, they might not necessarily limit me in ways I didn't want to be, you know, limited going into the training. Uh, but in this particular case, there was maybe a little bit more overlap than I would like. So I'll describe those exercises I do before she would get there typically. So I would go through a circuit of, again, this was my like second bicep day where I would just do one exercise and the profile was set up to be hard or short. So it was just something I could recover from pretty quickly before I got into like the full bicep day, which was the one I just described. Um, so I would again do like a preacher style setup, but in this case, the top was flat. It's not a typical preacher bench where you're leaning over it. This is something where I'm now my shoulders up higher. So I'm more shoulder flexed and I also turn on it. So I'm more abducted. So it would be like, you know, front double bicep pose with one arm. Someone says, show me your bicep and you lift your arm up towards your head, you know, and flex. Um, so I would do that. And the cable in this situation is actually coming from the top. So it's perpendicular to my forearm when my elbow is bent. I would do that in a circuit with rear delts, which I've been doing a uh, single arm, you know, either holding onto the ball from the cable or using a cuff or using a handle that was just pushing up against, um, you know, pushing up against the outside of my hand. So um, that I would try my best to set up in a way again, where it was heavy in the lengthened position and dropped off short. And I would sometimes, use a little bit of a turning motion with my body to make it, you know, even harder, short and easier, or sorry, harder, long and easier, short. And the third exercise in that circuit was a shrug where it wasn't like, again, using like a dumbbell that was pulling me straight down towards the floor, 
but I was in a little bit more of a arm away from my body position, which I would just naturally walk around in kind of that, like, you know, lat syndrome position, uh, you know, <laughs> most cases it would be invisible lat syndrome. <laughs> yeah. But in this case, it's visible lat syndrome. That's right. That's right. So more abducted position. Um, <clears throat> you know, I got a cable coming from the floor, basically the same place I'm, I'm doing pearls. And I'm able to position my body kind of leaning away from the cable, pushing through my foot, pushing through my hand on the bench and uh, doing uh, doing a shrug in a plane um, that, you know, ultimately like feels better on my shoulder, doesn't force me to use, you know, quite as much load as I would with say like a barbell or a dumbbell and gives me the ability to also not just like um, elevate my shoulders or pull them towards my ears, but also have a little bit of direction, you know, going backwards like a row and kind of a mix between the two. So <clears throat> I would do those three exercises. My thought going in is I'll probably take out the bicep curl, just like I took out the triceps. Um, so that I'm just training, you know, each muscle group once a week, taking out the short stuff, just kind of like cutting the fluff, right? Like instead of me taking a set away from like the meat and potatoes right now, I think it's just going to be kind of like, if there's things that are just, you know, not necessary, even if I'm kind of tied to them emotionally, just, you know, cutting them loose. So bicep curl would be one of those. Now, when we get into like rear doubt and trap, that's where there's a little bit of that attachment of like, okay, I know that my traps are working on other shit, like everything else, you know, basically doing, but probably to a much less degree than with most people's training because of how much we isolate things. So, you know, because it's a novel exercise to me, because I'm not doing a lot of just like picking up heavy shit all the time, um, you know, at least relative to what most other, you know, pro bodybuilders were doing, you know, heavy barbell rows, deadlifts, dumbbell rows, et cetera. You know, I'm not doing a lot of just like very broad unbiased training. So <clears throat> pretty, you know, weak in that position. Um, I think, you know, if we're going through kind of like a SWOT analysis and I say like, all right, what's the weakness? What's the threat here? Like the one thing I don't <laughs> love about it is <clears throat> if the pad is against my rib cage, it does provide this kind of lateral bending force uh, that doesn't feel great on the spine if I'm coming in uh, from a place, like I mentioned, you know, at the beginning of the podcast. So I found that, you know, pushing through my foot and pushing through my opposite hand against the pad is much better than having my rib cage push into the pad. Um, I do think, you know, the more that I can eliminate those forces, and, and this is also applied in the rear doubt, but the major difference is like with the rear doubt, the cable's pulling me upwards. It's not pulling me down towards the floor. I find in general things that are twisting me or side bending me and pulling me down towards the floor tend to feel worse than things that are twisting me and pulling me upwards. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the row at the beginning of the podcast, that's twisting me and pulling me down towards the floor. I think, you know, in the SWOT analysis, that's kind of like a big threat that, you know, I want to eliminate as much as possible. Now in prior weeks, I've been totally fine doing this. It's not particularly heavy. It was only really when I added the pull around, you know, where I'm sort of facing somewhat sideways on a machine. Again, you know, my rib cage is pressing into a pad. My foot is pushing into the floor to resist being twisted. That seems to be much more problematic than this shrug. Um, I think the traps, you know, show up in a good amount of poses, whether they're side poses like a side chest or the more obvious ones, like a, you know, most muscular pose. Um, I think you do see those upper traps, you know, in a good amount of poses and it's not something that I specifically isolate. So I think those, you know, two movements, like the rear doubt, again, I think kind of that upward direction, you know, wasn't so bad. Like it would be, I would really like to do something bilateral. For example, if I was like laying back on a bench, you know, and we talked about earlier, kind of the weight of your arms being assistance. Like if I use cables lying back on a bench, it's a pretty good profile. Uh, I don't have that same kind of twisting force. The disadvantage is it's a pain in the ass to set up. Like just getting the cables onto your hands is like nearly impossible. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Especially when you add any kind of load. So I'm kind of thinking that's impractical where I'm looking to get your take here is just like, all right, you know, risk reward, whether that be time cost, you know, budgeting total sets, um, or, you know, orthopedic strain, 
you know, and, 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 and also exercise order, right? Like I would probably be doing these things last in my training session if I wasn't trying to just like avoid any having to do, you know, the shrugs with me. Um, but, uh, you know, those two right now are ones that I could like definitely part with. And I think just like contextually going into this prep, my mindset is very much like there are some ancillary things where it's like, I'm very curious how much ab training matters for bodybuilding presentation. I'm curious how much specifically training like spinal erectors, whether directly or indirectly uh, would matter. I'm curious about, you know, traps. And my thought is like, skip it see how I look this season. And then if any of those are specifically weaknesses to isolate them in the future, that's always a tough thing. You're like, look, I want to do everything that I can do to be as good as I can be right now. But if you do those things, you also don't know if they matter until you find out that they do. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have the risk of that they do matter, but you benefit in the future by not adding up a bunch of shit that doesn't matter. So I definitely lean towards not doing the things that we can make a case for not mattering and then getting to the show and finding out like, okay, maybe next season I do isolated ab work or isolated trap work or whatever the thing that is, you know, I can be critical of on stage and, and just try my best to sort of be objective about, is it worth doing those things? Cause you could certainly do, you know, as many bodybuilders do, you know, abs every day in the morning before their cardio session, and it's like, does that shit really matter? Um, probably not, but oftentimes in ways that you don't expect, where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it helps you to pose them better. And, you know, maybe you could just practice posing, but maybe a little bit of resistance there actually teaches you to contract them in a way that you otherwise wouldn't. So oftentimes there's reasons we don't think about. And, you know, maybe we don't know that until there's a problem. And uh, I think it's reasonable to say like, all right, let's, do the least amount we need to let's figure out if any of those things are a weakness and then we can always add them later. Yeah. So my, so I kind of intuitively lean in the same direction in so far as including or excluding those kind of ancillary activities um, in terms of the trap specifically, but I think more, more contextually, it will be helpful for us to hear what the rest of the selections look like that day, because if mm -hmm. they are very differentiated, that would be the thing that would kind of maybe make me lean in the other direction of like, okay, what are the other things that you're doing? And are those gaps being filled from a force direction standpoint? Because if they're, for example, if you don't have anything loaded, and I, I feel like you probably do, but if you don't have anything loaded in that sort of more low to high pulling direction, uh, then I would want to keep those. But if you do have something that's loaded in more of that retraction type plane, then I would want to for now eliminate those. Got it. So the last thing I would do before she got there would be this pull down that is uh, made uh, by Stairmaster. Uh, <laughs> never expect, but this gym I train at, you know, most of the equipment's from probably like the eighties, you know, on average. And there is this pull down that <clears throat> has this kind of wide arcing motion to it. And uh, I guess the, you know, to give kind of a visual, like the arm path is not so dissimilar from what you would get just by doing a normal lap pull down. So if you had this like, you know, typical wide grip, you know, what people would call like a pronated, you know, lap pull down position, I think, you know, the arm path, at least at the shoulder would look relatively similar. Um, on this machine, I'm able to take a neutral grip and what it, it has like an arcing motion that goes from like handles together to basically handles out and then back in again. Um, <clears throat> the way I set that up is I take a pad, I wedge it um, basically between like, you know, uh, the machine and like my, um, basically like my pelvis and my and, and rib cage so that when I lean back, I'm able to still push into the pad a little bit. And now I have, again, like a, a little bit of an anchor to push into as I pull down on the machine. Because normally it would just have like these pads pressing down on my um, on my thighs. And I found it helpful on some machines where it's pulling you forward and not just up. 
to take a long, you know, in a lot of these old school gyms, they just have a bunch of like long pads laying around, you know, they're wooden pads that are just covered uh, much like if you just took the bottom foot bench off, you know, that you lay on top of and kind of cut that in half. So I wedge that so I can still kind of press um, my pelvis and, uh, you know, rib cage just below my chest into that thing as it's pulling me forward. The experience I get from that movement, uh, I believe, is a lot of like Terry's involvement in a way that I don't really feel on anything else. Like there's obviously, you know, some lat, some weird doubt. Um, but I think what I'm feeling most is like Terry's on that in a way where, you know, if I just walk over and do a normal lat pull down, I definitely experience, you know, to a degree, but it is really interesting that arc of motion I've never seen on any other piece of equipment. Uh, so just kind of wanted to get your take on how differentiated that is, how relevant that is, and maybe like, just like how that would compare to maybe doing any other type of pull down movement yeah so i think much in the same way that you can think about a press against a fly with any kind of vertical pulling motion that is done more traditionally so like the traditional you get into the cable lat pull down and it's the just the what we call the lat pull down bar and it's just a this direct vertical loading regardless of where you take your arm path whether it is more sort of in what looks to be the frontal plane or more like the sagittal thing the load is still of a perfectly vertical you know direction so regardless of how much you just try to isolate the motion of of your humerus there's still this depression resistance that we have to sort of buckle down with lats against but when you describe the kind of pull down that has this sort of arcing type thing, which again, for anyone listening that maybe can't picture it, I mean, you got to just like Google Stairmaster pull down. Maybe who, who even knows if you would find it? Um, but it is it is sort of arcing. And so in somewhat of a similar way, depending on what part of the range you're looking at, um, its loading is less specific to shoulder girdle translation or loading shoulder girdle translation, which in essence just means that because the direction is changing, it's actually more specific to the way that your arm is arcing rather than just the whole shoulder girdle moving together. So what this would mean is if you were to do like a force analysis of the machine, much like in a leg extension or a leg curl, you would see actually a changing direction uh, in terms of what the handle is doing to to the body, um, as opposed to just something that was always in the same direction the whole time. Like So there is a little bit of a shift in that way. So essentially anything that is sort of more arcing with the arm, whether it's like a, a pressing motion, uh, a fly motion would be a better example rather, uh, or whether it's like a pull down fly type motion. You know, the reason that you feel flies much more in your rear delt is because your rear delt doesn't move your shoulder girdle. It just moves your arm and your scapula closer together. And the same thing is, is true with the Terry's where if you are doing a pull down motion that is more in line with where your humerus is moving, as opposed to where the whole girdle is moving as in a regular lat pull down, um, you're going to load the muscles more that don't move the whole shoulder girdle, but really just move the upper arm. Uh, and when you were in that plane of motion that is more vertical as compared to more horizontal, that's like where Terry's major is really going to operate. It's basically, you can think of it like it's a lat that doesn't really move the shoulder girdle. So anytime you are using a load direction or a loading parameter that is more directly loading your your upper arm as opposed to your whole sort of shoulder girdle you'll get more of the single joint stuff i.e rear delt and teres as opposed to lats now obviously you can't get rid of lats because they also move your arm but as a relative proportion of length change your lats contribute much more to all of the translatory type stuff so i think that's um a great that's like a great uh thing to have in mind which is like your your teres and your rear delts are basically uh, these two players that will work uh, that will work much more with those arcing type motions. And there's kind of this cool trade-off between how much each of them works, right? So for example, if you're doing a pull down, there will be some rear delt involvement, but as a relative proportion, Terry's has a much better mechanical advantage in those positions. But if you were to just do like a reverse fly, let's say that was like, you know, sort of more low to high, 
everyone intuitively knows that's like maybe not everyone intuitively knows but a lot of people intuitively feel much more rear del as opposed to the vague sort of armpit like stimulus and so from a structural perspective the rear del kind of runs for anyone watching runs kind of like at an angle from you know scapula down to the arm um whereas terry's runs from scapula lower up to the arm so they form this like x like fashion or this X like arrangement, which basically just means that the motions that are mostly loading upper arm motion that are more vertical is more of a Terry's thing. And then as you move the arm down uh, and you start to mimic similar motions, that sort of transitions up into rear delt stuff. So it's cool how the body has these kinds of trade-offs, um, both with, you know, something like the Terry's rear delt sort of X arrangement, and then also just the fan shape of the lat and how the lat contribution will change in a, in a similar sort of a way, you know? So if you're doing a pull down point being, and it's this arcing type thing, you'll have less of the lat and more of the other stuff. And then it would be probably the inverse where, you know, you still have the Terry's, you still have some rear delt uh, in, in, you know, a normal lat pull down, but as a relative proportion, you have much more lat. So that to me would fit more under upper back category overall which obviously still necessitates things like traps and things like rhomboids to be able to actually serve as the anchor off of which those other tissues pull the arm uh, downward. So, you know, that machine has a tendency uh, to break, especially if I put more plates on it. Yeah. Uh, last week, you know, it was broken again and I used like a prime, uh, well, in this case, strive, you know, like 1980s pull down um you know does again it's loaded more vertically doesn't have that arcing path but the handles at least can move independently and there's some options as far as grip you know when i do that you know and i have to lean back you know a, a, a good amount to sort of like um position both my shoulder and kind of offset the way the load is pulling me um you know i'm not feeling nearly as much stimulus you know directly on the terry is like it's obviously much more broad right like you mentioned we're going to get more lat when the load direction is in that fashion and um you know i'm also not able to i'm, I'm sort of leaning back a, a, as an anchor of sorts but i'm not able to set up anything uh where i can push my chest into a pad like i can on the other one so i am you know even though in this particular example I can aid the profile by adjusting the strive machine and I can also have, you know, a partner on the other side of the machine kind of pushing on the lever and assisting me, you know, into the short position. Um, you know, again, it'll come down to the rest of the program, but, you know, when we're looking at a pull down and we're saying, all right, what do we want to bias here? Like we could, you know, pull the cables apart and feel a little bit more rear delt we could, you know, maybe find a machine uh, very rarely that kind of arcs like the one I described and I feel more Terry's. We could do more of a normal pull down, whether that be on a cable stack or whether it be, that be on a machine like the one I just described. And maybe we can hit everything a little bit more broadly. And then it's just kind of deciding for myself then, you know, based on the, the limitations, advantages and uh, of each of those machines and what I specifically want to highlight, all right, which direction do I go in? And it's just something I guess to keep in mind as we frame the rest of the program and just then come back to like, all right, what are the you know advantages of each? Because there's also practical, right? Like I said, I can't, I'm like afraid to break the machine again. So I don't want to pin load too much weight on it. Yeah. Uh, so what I've been doing is just using shorter rest periods and more sets uh, to mount fatigue. So I've been like working towards six sets of 10 with 30 seconds rest period where like the first time I did the full stack, you know, if I do 10, I could probably do, you know, mid 20 reps. Um, but when I rest short, rest short, and again, really focus on uh, maybe pausing a little bit longer, short, really slowing down the tempo, all that thing. I, all those things I described doing uh, in yesterday's workout, um, I'm able to get to the point where the first time I did that, I set like four out of six, I'm getting eight reps. And then the next set, I'm getting six reps. And I've just been building up to the point where I can do all sets, you know, for 10. And I don't think that's the same if I just did it for three, but I'm literally doubling the amount of sets that I'm doing. So it's a way to use less load um, and really just like, you know, highlight, um, 
the uh, you, you know basically like make the thing harder where I normally wouldn't want to make it harder, but for the reason of not having to use much load. So I guess we'll just kind of put that in the back pocket and say, all right, we can kind of come back to this idea of should I do traps? Uh, the rear doubt, like you mentioned, you know, is maybe better positioned to do something like a rowing movement. Whereas like when I'm doing the rear doubt, it's coming vertically, you know, I'm pulling down and across. Um, so we have those in the back pocket, the potential isolated rear doubt, potential isolated trap. And, you know, we could call it like a more biased, you know, Terry's pull down. Those are all kind of question marks for me. So then, you know, just framing the rest of the training session here, uh, we're moving into where I would normally start with, you know, if I'm just walking into the gym with no other constraints. So the very first thing I do is a pullover machine. So I have Nautilus pullover machine, and I've been playing around with the setup on this. I mean, the most obvious uh, anchor that I need here is a belt underneath me. If I don't have that, the machine just pulls me right out of the seat. You're going to be super weak. So the machine actually comes with a belt uh, underneath. And, you know, that was a pretty obvious addition for them. I have to bring my own belt because the one on the machine is 40 years old. But so I bring two belts. I bring one for underneath me and I bring one for my chest. You know, again, as always, shout out to Tom Purvis here using his pullover machine at his gym uh, set up in a very similar way. So belt underneath, belt on the chest resisting being pulled out of the seat and then you know as i'm trying to uh pull that uh you know as, as i'm getting into the part of the arc where i'm trying to pull it towards me having something to shove into going forward is useful additionally i have like a rounded pad behind me that also makes that position a little bit easier to shove into because as i'm sort of going down and then forward uh, as i press into the seat belt having um a little bit more of like a, a ridge, having something that I can sh um, now sort of like fall over the top of. I have a feeling you could probably describe this better than I could, but it gets me into a position where I'm kind of like um, tipping downwards and able to get into the short position. Or maybe it's just simply I'm moving my whole body forward, you know, in, in this arc. And that seems to make it a little bit easier to get short. Um <clears throat> Previously, I was also attaching handles on uh, the, the the top of the pullover because I just found it's very difficult for me to either, either I would grab the top of it um, and then there'd be certain parts of the arc where I couldn't shove my elbows down or I'd grab the sides and I couldn't really get my arms overhead. So I attached handles to the top of it and that allowed me to potentially get into a little bit more of a lengthened position because it's you know, as I'm bringing my arms overhead, um, if I'm following the arc of this machine truly, like there's not much shoulder flexion I can get from this position. Whereas if I was doing like, say a cable pull down, you know, there's a degree of rotation that has to happen at my shoulder, which if I went through that rotation, uh, my elbows would no longer be on the pad. So because the pads require my shoulders to be, you know, outwards or abducted that's not a position that i can maintain as my arms go overhead um so where i've gotten to at this point is much treating it much like the fly motions that we described in day one and just focusing more on like the mid to short position of this pullover machine mm -hmm. and you know, as i was trying to get into the length in position more it's kind of funky at the shoulders like lose a little bit of shove on the pads and i'm trying to make up for that with the handles and i'm like you know what I'll get towards the long position, but let me just focus on sort of the mid to short. We'll hit that long position elsewhere, which I think is kind of a trend in some of my programming where it's like, if I really want to line up the force directions, well, a lot of times I need two exercises. So I have all that set up. Uh, and he helps me, you know, with the profile even more by kind of shoving down on the handle in the short position. And that gives us, you know, again, a really good profile as uh, I approach failure. So categorically, you're kind of lump. You're that's like an exercise that's just like a lot of kind of everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. Of course, you know, we think of this as like a lat exercise, but and I, I leave with a pretty good lat pump when I'm doing it. But you know, with this arc, it's like well, it's not really vertical so much. Like there's a part of it that's vertical, and then there's a part of it that's kind of horizontal. So 
I can't make the um, the total analogy of like, okay, this is like doing the pack fly costal into, you know, the, the pack press, you know, costal, right? It's like along those lines in the sense that I can't, I'm not, not really getting any of these tissues, you know, fully lengthened. I'm focusing on the bottom position of this particular machine. But as far as just saying like, okay, this is just like, you know, lat isolation. I can't say that even though that's a thing I feel, uh, you know, the majority of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think with these kinds of changing directions, direction motions, um, it's important to think about like which of the, all of the potential tissues that could act against this pad right now could potentially perform the entire motion, right? So like upper ish lats would be an example of a tissue that they can pull your arm sort of down from here and they can still act toward the bottom. And so your brain, I think preferentially will choose the thing that can probably do most of the whole motion as opposed to like starting with this muscle and then transitioning to this muscle and then transitioning to this muscle. So like, of course the, there's other bits of involvement, but if you're talking rate limiter on a motion like that, it makes sense that, you know, the tissue or the tissues that would perform most of the range would be, you know, the most readily recruited. And just for reference, I think I've expressed this to you before. I've never been the biggest fan of pullover motions. They've just never really agreed with me. Um, so I so I tend to uh, stick to rows and pull downs and, and reverse flies and those type things. Um, you know, especially now that we're seeing, you know, a lot of this long length uh, bullshit coming out and people are opting to go back to the pullover as like mainstream thing. And I'm really hoping that uh, the pullover doesn't make a resurgence uh, because I feel like it's kind of quieting down right now. <laughs> but in, in the context of the Nautilus machine, uh, that sort of mid to short range probably feels awesome. Uh, I'm really just discussing, I think to your point about the necessity to change shoulder rotation throughout the range of flexion extension. I think that's a big part of why it feels so clunky uh, to me and others, but just thought I would mention that in there is like, that probably sounds like it would be really good for the, the, the bottom half. Yeah. I do remember after we did that, that one day, I mean, we did a bunch of things, but we were both super fucked up. Yeah. I was, I was like, this is not, yeah, this was not the, this was not the thing for me. Yeah. No, no, I mean in a good way. Like, um, no, no, but for me, for me, I had like, um, I, the next day I woke up, I had this like thoracic spine, like yeah. discomfort. Yeah, yeah. So, but one hundred percent, yeah, I was totally fucked up muscularly <laughs> too. Yeah. Um. So then I moved from there again to more like, uh, you know, length and bias, and this is a very like vertically oriented force direction. So. I'm doing a pull down on a machine where, uh, you know, the, the handles can rotate and they're actually kind of diverging as I pull down. So the handles are moving away from each other. And again, like the other plate loaded machine I described for the incline bench, there's this long lever in the back where someone can push on that thing and have a pretty big mechanical advantage on me. So what I do is I just focus on really the, the length and position, because if I were to pull these handles all the way down, they actually diverge a little bit too much. Yeah. And the short position uh, is not feeling as good as what I can get to in this, you know, arm overhead, arms, you know, together position uh, that I'm showing here. So my, my, you know, my, my forearms, you know, are more in like a palm sort of facing each other to almost supinated position at the top just whatever i can comfortably get into and um still be controlling the motion with my lats so i think it's important to note that like when i'm focusing on the length and position it's not a stretch it's not like i'm getting on something that is like pulling me into position like i'm controlling the position i'm stopping it and then i'm pulling the other way i'm not so you know my wife's on the other end of the machine she's pushing down which is literally pulling me up and I'm, you know, I got a few plates on each side. So it's, you know, still decently heavy pulling down something I could, again, I could do for, you know, 15, 20 reps. She's pushing down, which is making it even harder on the eccentric. And I'm controlling that, I'm controlling that, I'm lengthening uh, the lats in that vertical direction. And then she still is applying resistance as I start the concentric and just kind of letting off as I come down. And again, it falls into that sort of lengthened partial type of, of movement, just like I'm doing for the pecs and, uh, you know, just biasing the, the, the length and position there. Um, 
anything else to describe. Um, I guess, again, I like that I'm able to fatigue the lats a little bit and not have it loaded um, via wrists and elbows so that when I come into this, I don't need to use as much load. Um, so maybe normally I'd be using four, four and a quarter or something. You know, I can mm -hmm. really fatigue the lats first on the pullover and then I come here. That was a little bit shorter. This is a little bit longer, properly, you know, quote unquote, warmed up coming into this. And we can really bias uh, what I believe to be more of a length and position for these vertical fibers. Cool. So on this day, then we're kind of going pullover thing into assuming that we don't talk about the ancillary stuff first, pullover thing into more vertical thing. Yeah. Um, so I've been informed I have somewhat of a time constraint here, like five, 10 minutes. Okay, so I want to, I got cardio to do also. So okay. So I want to, I want to just finish by mentioning, I want you to just briefly mention like what are the other exercises? Yeah. And then what we can do next week is we can finish with the back stuff and you and I can, you know, text about the specific stuff also along and it'll be interesting to see if there are any sort of changes to the discussion across this week but finish the back stuff um today briefly and then let's just put a tie on the back training next episode and then we'll cover the leg stuff there so we'll cool. finish up and then go to lower yeah you and i will finish via text i actually do want to have the training program before i get to yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah. we'll uh yeah, so end of this, you know, I'm moving from more of a vertical pull to now more horizontal. The thing that I'll, you know, I'm going to certainly keep in there that, you know, will be sort of like the, probably the tail end will be, I'm doing a, uh, a seated row with the chest pad um, and the handles are diverging. They're coming away from each other. And I perceive that to be very much like rear delt oriented. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love that thing. I know. Yeah. That's such a good, uh, that's like my favorite row. I, I think I've ever used like chest supported. Cool. Um, so then between those two, um, you know, we had talked a little bit about like what's really contributing to the front double bicep front lat presentation. You know, we have lat fibers running vertically, horizontally, we have Terry's and, you know, uh, serratus all, all presenting there. You know, you have your lateral raises that are contributing serratus wise. You have, you know, different forms of the pull, uh, pull downs for, you know, teres. And then we have something vertically and something horizontally oriented uh, lat wise. Now the horizontal one lat wise is really, you know, where I've been struggling. And like I mentioned, um, I've tried some different setups. I was doing a hammer strength row that again, was coming low to high. And, um, you know, I have my body turned. I get a little bit of assistance short from Annie it's a fixed handle. It's in more of like an underhand grip position. Um, you know, it, it's terrible profile. It's a hammer strength machine. I can <laughs> definitely get some help, you know, from, you know, my training partner there, the handle's not in like the greatest position. So sometimes I'll attach a handle there as well. I tried it on the Atlantis machine. That's like the plate loaded one of what we have where the profile is actually much better there, even probably better than the machine we have. And uh, that one's got revolving handles. I can set up, you know, another pad where I can lean back a little bit. But, you know, when I really think about, like, I just sit here and kind of bring my arm across my body and I try to feel like, you know, what is a lengthened position for what seem, feels like my, uh, you know, horizontally or thoracic, uh, more horizontally oriented uh, fibers. Um, it doesn't seem like I really need to twist my body that much. It almost seems like more of just like a reach forward kind of a deal with a little bit of adduction or, or shoulder moving in, uh, moving inward motion. So I'm almost leaning towards maybe just doing something bilateral um, or, you know, something that's more loading like a uh, just pulling me forward position versus pulling me across position. I think I just want to find something that just has the least amount of downside to it because I found there is, you know, consider just a consistent downside for me trying to do these like pull around motions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in agreement with that. And I think that um, this is something I, I want to get into explaining, but I want to save it for, um, 
for next week. I think that just very broad scopes, it's good to keep in mind that with these morphological changes come changes to just practicality of doing certain things like single arm pressing becomes exponentially more difficult. Single arm pulling becomes exponentially difficult, both in terms of the precision of the setup. And then also the, just the actual forces on things like rotation, as opposed to just, you know, the, the shoulder complex stuff. So, okay. Yeah. You and I will talk about that stuff one-on-one -on -one, and then we'll kind of go over maybe what we talked about privately and then move into legs uh, next week. That sounds good. Cool. Yeah, sounds great. All right, sweet.